Today I want to kick off a series um, called The Table. And I want to read a verse to you and then I'll explain just a little bit. And um, because I love Melissa so much, I'm going to read a verse out of the NLT. And uh, so I'm going to need it on the screens because I don't own an NLT. So if you can throw that up on the screens, I can quote it to you in about every other translation. But 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well. Use them, but use them well to serve one another. To serve one another. Can I just read you the whole context of that verse just for a moment? I'm, because I'm a New King James guy. Let me read just a couple of verses ahead of it. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. This is verse 7 of 1 Peter chapter 4. And above all things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Be good stewards of it. But he's like, this is what's going to happen at the end of time. There's going to be a temptation to not want to serve. And if you do serve, you want to grumble about it. So the way to do this in the end of all things is to love one another Love covers a multitude of sin. Serve one another and do it without grumbling. That's basically what Peter was saying. So I want to talk to you just for the next four weeks, really, about a table that my mother had my father build. How many of you have ever went to a family reunion and wound up having to sit at the card table? All right. How many of you now have graduated to the big table? And then your family quit getting together because you got to the big table. Or you wound up hosting it now. And you're setting up card tables. So my, as our family began to grow, well, there were six of us. My mother, my father, I have two sisters. And, we, and then my brother, Michael. We keep asking my mother if there's something we should know about, about who actually is the parents of our sisters. But... Um, <laughs> Come on, you all think the same thing about your crazy relatives. Matter of fact, at Purpose Conference, I pulled my mother aside and I'm like, listen, we need to have a serious talk. Just joking. <clears throat> but seriously. So there's six of us. And as we begin to get married, Melissa and I have been married the second longest in our family. I'm the youngest by age. And then there's, so it was my sister, then my brother, my other sister, then me. And then as we got to get married, we started having kids, and all of a sudden, there's 27 of us. And my mom was tired of, at Thanksgiving and Christmas, that half the family was sitting at one table, and everybody else was sitting over here wherever we could find a little spot for them. So she commissioned my dad that she wanted a table where everybody could sit at the same table. There's 27 of us. So my dad commissions a couple Amish carpenters to build my mother a table uh, that's out of, it's built out of white oak, and uh, it has uh, 10 leaves with it, and it can go from a table of six or eight, and then it expands out. And so after my, my father passed away, I asked my mom, well, what furniture do you want to keep when you move? And she said, well, I'm keeping that table. And whatever house you get me or build for me, it must fit that table. So my mom has this big curio cabinet sitting over along the wall, and all the leaves are in there, and they're numbered. And so when it's just, you know, it was just her and my dad, they would, they would put it all the way down. But then as the family become, they would expand the table out as was necessary to fit the amount of people that were going to be there for dinner. And out of that, I begin to think about the church and how the church is a table. God has no desire for some of his children to sit over here at the big table. And then over here, some of the kids are sitting over here at a card table. And there's some sort of pecking order based on age or talent or skill or ability that matters which table you sit at. But God's desire is for every one of his children to sit at the same table under the same roof, have the same entertainment, the same conversations, the same messages, and be in his presence while he sits at the head of the table. Now, I want to just 
begin this little conversation just by talking about where the church is and then we're going to go to how the church should be. You know, each and every week here at Purpose House, we serve people. We serve all of you that are in this room today and all of you that are watching on cameras or by on YouTube or however you're watching it. The reason why you're able to do that is because somebody chose to serve. And so we serve people in all different areas to handle all the various outlets of ministry that we do here. And we utilize a lot of outlets to spread the message of Jesus Christ, not just on Sundays anymore, but every day of the week, there are various outlets that we use to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the church, for the lack of a better way to explain it, is the table. And the table or the church has changed drastically in the last four years. And most of us would say, yep, yeah, the pandemic, that really brought on a massive change in the church. But really, before the pandemic, the church uh, was changing drastically. And especially in America, the church was changing very quickly in America, even before the pandemic. And the decline of the American church is well documented. The Gallup polls reported that in 2020, before 2020, 47% of Americans regularly attended religious services of any faith. Only 47%. So all of you that thought we were a Christian nation, even going into the pandemic, the majority of Christians did not attend church. 53% did not attend. 47% attended church services regularly before the pandemic. Then that number before the pandemic at 47% was down 20%. So in 1999, 67% of Americans were attending church regularly. In 1999, 67% were attending church. By 2020, we were down 20 points. We were down to 47% of Americans were attending church. Then uh, this decline was beginning all way back because in the 1960s, it was 73% of Americans were going to church. And that held steady for almost 50 years, that number. And then it began to decline. And after the pandemic happened, and if you're not familiar with the pandemic, welcome. <laughs> Pew Research says that we are now only at 30% of Americans attending church on a regular basis. And of all the churches in America, only 43% of churches in America are back to their pre-pandemic levels. Over half of the churches in America have not recovered from the COVID pandemic. We at Purpose House are an exception to that rule. Matter of fact, our attendance is up 24% over 2021. And it's up 9% over 2022. That's in person. Because now the table has changed so much that you no longer can just prepare a table for people who are in person. Now, how many of y'all like to go on vacation and watch church services? But if you're at home today and you're sitting there eating a cinnamon roll and you're more than capable of getting into a car and driving to church, I'm not really talking to you. I'm trying to convict you. Bring the cinnamon roll and let's have communion together. So we're doing very well in person, but our broadcast, which we broadcast out over YouTube and then also over Facebook and some other avenues on YouTube, this is just from 2022 to the end of 2023, our YouTube broadcast is up 77% in one year. In, I'm reading all these papers that these st wonderful staff members have given to me. The amazing thing was is that in 2022 and before, this church had no audience under the age of 35 years old. But in 2023, we went from 0% of people under the age of 35 watching our church services to about 30% of our church services are now watched by people who are 35 years and younger. So we're reaching a different dynamic. You wonder why I'm saying all this. I'm going to get there in just a moment. So we're up 
almost 73,000 people watching our church services on a weekly basis in one year. We had almost 630,000 people interact with one of our YouTube videos, which is a 75% increase. For those of you that love Facebook, we're up 467.8% in one year on Facebook. The amount of people that visit a Purpose House church page is up 624.6% in one year. The reason why I say all that is that we have something special going on. And for all the people that get all uptight about the Holy Spirit, from the time that we stood in this pulpit and announced that we were unapologetically a spirit-filled church, absolutely 400 people walked out of this building. But in turn, there were a whole lot more hungry people for the Holy Spirit that came into this building and are tuning in online. So what the enemy tries to silence is the very thing that people are hungry for. They want the Holy Spirit and they want every function of the Holy Spirit operating in a church. They don't want a church church service that's confined to 35 minutes and get you out the door and you check a box. What they want to feel is the Shekinah glory of the Almighty God and they want to feel the rush of angels' wings. They want to feel the anointing of God. They want to see the gifts of the Spirit in operation and experience the gifts of the Spirit in operation because they walked in broke but they're walking out healed. That is what needs to happen in the American church. So we're doing well. In a season of inflation, our giving was up 5%. People say, that's no big deal. Yeah, it is. It's a very big deal because you in Southern Illinois, you know, you impoverished folks, you're sitting in buildings that are debt free. You have something very special happening right here in Southern Illinois. We have a table that is being prepared for us. So we have something special, but we also must be aware that the table that we come to, the church that we come to, it still needs to expand. We need to grab a couple more leaves and pull the table apart and drop some more leaves in the table, grab a few more place settings and a few more chairs and invite some more people to come to the table of the Lord. We're not inviting them to sit at a card table. We're not inviting them to sit out in the parking lot. We're not inviting you to an outdoor service. We're inviting you to the same table that we pull up to and we eat at the presence of the Lord. We need to start inviting people to the table of the Lord. But before you can invite people, Somebody's got to be prepared to serve. Because the church is a table. And what do you do at a table? Now, I know some of you are like, we fight at the table. No, we ate at the table. People get fed at a table. In John chapter 6 and verse 35, maybe you're familiar with this verse, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Now, how many of y'all love just good smelling wonderful bread in the oven. Y'all got to pray for Pastor Melissa because she come home from Nashville with some bread. She puts that bread in the oven. And my Lord, I got hangry. Because <laughs> it was bread I couldn't eat. And I'm like, why are you cooking that in this house to smell that bread? And I wanted to dig into the oven and eat it while it was in the oven anywhere that Melissa could not tell me, no, you can't eat that because it's got this stuff. Do you know what makes bread good? Gluten. <laughs> so she's cooking this bread, but I, listen, none of y'all have celiac spiritual disease. When Jesus cooks bread and you smell it, you can partake of it. You're not allergic to his bread. He is the bread of life. And when the church starts cooking, I think y'all know where I'm going with this, right? When the church starts cooking, it should cause people who are hungry to smell that bread and desire to climb into the oven and eat it. But what we have is a bunch of spiritual people who walk around and tell people you can't have that bread. You're not qualified to eat that bread. Well, if you're breathing, you're qualified to eat the bread. And I want you to come and I want you to taste of the bread of life and taste and see that the Lord is good. He's the bread of life. And how many of you, uh, you know, the other night, 
Ms. Don and PJ, they sent me a text about somewhere they were eating, and God forgive you for it. And they, they were eating at some seafood place, and I'm like, I'm like, where is this place? I've never even heard of this place. And my mouth began to salivate because I like a good restaurant. Y'all like good restaurants? I love good restaurants, and I've ate at some pretty incredible places in my lifetime. One of my favorite restaurants, the food is terrible, but the restaurant is amazing, is Casa Bonita. If you've never been to Casa Bonita, go to Denver, go out, it's right around Golden, and go to Casa Bonita. It's the only place where you can have a horrible cheese and enchilada and watch cliff diving and gunfights. <laughs> the, the main courses are terrible, but bring the sopapillas and you'll be there all day long. They have these little flags on the table that if it's down, you don't want anything. But if you raise the flag, they come and they say, would you like anything? And the dude would drop off the soap of peas and I would just raise the flag again. Like, come on back here with another basket of them. Just bring them back. It is one of the most amazing places. And so I took my kids there um, because I tried to brace them. The restaurant's not all that great. Just wait till the dude gets shot right at the table. Wait till this dude backflips off of this. It's just an amazing Casamita. Or my parents took us to Depot Bay, Oregon, and we're sitting right on the water, and we're having salmon sitting in Depot Bay, Oregon. There's nothing like Moe's Seafood Restaurant in Depot Bay, Oregon. Just an amazing place. We could argue about Ruth Chris or Morton Steakhouse or Eddie V's in Nashville, but I'm, I'm, it's just some amazing places. But have you ever been to a place where you built it up so much to the people that you were taking there, and then when you get there, it isn't all that you thought it was going to be, and now you're like rooting for the restaurant, please be as good as you were the first time, because I brought these people, and I was talking to them about how good your food is, and the hostess was a jerk, and the waiter didn't want to wait on you, and the food was forever, and it got Got cold and you're like well the first time I was here it was really good anybody ever been there what a shame to do the same thing in church you build it up you build it up and then you're praying please don't let brother so-and-so do that if I mean listen he doesn't always do that you must have not grown up Pentecostal if you had to make excuses for people that were sitting next to the person that you brought to church. Because, right, you thought, well, if sister so-and-so is not there and we sit here, we might be safe. And then about halfway through the church service, sister so-and-so migrated from that side of the church to right behind your visitor and let out a war hoop and sent chills, chills up your spine and scared them into the Holy Ghost. Anybody ever been there? If you're not, welcome to Purpose House. You're here now. And so there's nothing more frustrating than to prepare yourself to just eat a fantastic meal only to have the service be subpar or some other element of the dining experience just leave a taste in your mouth that would cause you to think, I would never want to come back here again or cause you to not enjoy the experience that you're having. Remember, Jesus said he is the bread of life. He is the ultimate bread, the ultimate food. And I would tend to argue that the ultimate food, the ultimate bread, deserves the ultimate presentation. I believe Jesus deserves our best. Now, I grew up that that was about clothing. We wore suits because we needed to dress our best. So let me just say this since I'm teaching this series. I don't care what you wear to church. And the reason why I wear a suit sometimes and I wear jeans sometimes and I wear boots sometimes and I wear dress shoes sometimes, the reason why I do that is because I do not want a uniform to happen in God's house. I don't care if you wear a suit. I don't care if you wear blue jeans. I don't care if you wear, oh, wear bib overhauls. Just bring your heart with you. And if you bring your heart, he'll minister to your heart. We don't have a dress code that gets you into this restaurant. We just need your heart to come. And if your heart comes, he'll feed you. He's the ultimate bread. I believe he deserves the ultimate presentation. The challenge that we have as the church in the culture in which we live in right now and all around the world, our challenge is not to put on you shine. Our challenge is not to have a good worship team. Our challenge is not to have a beautiful building. Our challenge is to feed people. Our goal is to feed people. And that's what we are required to do is to feed people and so we call that here, what we call that is to reach, to teach, and to equip people. That's feeding people. We want to reach people who are hungry, teach other people how to feed themselves, and then equip other people to go out and find hungry people and show them where to get something to eat. 
to reach, to teach, and to equip people with the gospel. And so that's the purpose of this church, is to reach, to teach, and to equip. But you cannot teach what you have not reached. And you cannot equip those who you are unwilling to teach. And you will never keep anything that you have reached without teaching and equipping it. So let me put that in modern terms because Jesus used modern language. You will not reach people who you don't like. You don't have to be like them, but you do have to like them. And what we've developed in this culture of the church is, is that if you even have a conversation with somebody who is a sinner, then you're a sinner. Y'all need to get into the church culture because what you have here is very rare. But if a preacher stands next to a sinner and says, I'm going to stand up for you so that you can find your way to God, that preacher is run out on a rail. Let me tell you something. I spend most of my time around saved people. They're crazy. (laughs) It is refreshing to get around people who know nothing of Christ and begin to talk to them about Christ. Because you get around church people and they want to argue with you about the Nephilim and argue about this and argue about that. But the person who is hungry could care less about your view of Genesis chapter 6 and verse 4 or whether you're pre-trib or mid-trib or post-trib. They just want to know, do you have any bread? Do you have any? It's refreshing when you get around people who are satisfied with Jesus. And I'm just going to defend one of my brothers in the ministry. If you are accused of being too entrapped with Jesus or too enamored with Jesus, then let them accuse you all they want about your relationship with Jesus. They're the ones with a heart problem and are no longer enamored with the one who died for them and who is causing them to live again. In this house, we're going to be enamored with Jesus and I'm going to be associated with people where Jesus is enough. He is enough. If you're not careful, that's why you get caught up with all these winds of doctrine because you're not caught up with Jesus. I'm caught up in Jesus. You know why? Because Jesus was caught up in me. You all remember this song, right? When he was on the cross, I was on his mind. I'm caught up in him because he was caught up with me. And so our job is to reach, to teach, and equip, and we need to make sure that we're equipping people and teaching them, and most of all, we are reaching them. Because if you're not reaching people, then teaching gets boring. And if you're not reaching people, then equipping, you're equipping people who are already equipped. But the church has to have some amazing things operating in it. There are people in this building or online who are not yet Christ followers. That's called reaching people. And then there are people in the building who've stepped over the line. You're a part of the family of God. And one of our goals here at Purpose House is to feed you as well. We have to prepare a meal that reaches multiple facets of people. And so if you come to this church and you're like, one week he does this and the next week he does that, that's called balance. And we're going to do, we're going to do a series called The Four Faces. And we're going to come out of the book of Ezekiel with the creature that had four faces. It had the face of an ox and the face of an eagle and the face of a man and then the face of a lion. It had these four faces. And those four faces all represent something different. And the wheels would turn. And one time they would go this direction. And one time they would go this direction. And the other time, they, but the faces never turn. The wheels just were moving. And sometimes we're going to be a church of prayer. And we're going to focus on prayer. And then there's going to be times we're going to focus on worship. And then there's going to be times we're focused over here on the gifts of the Spirit. We're not going away from in the one thing going towards another we're just trying to have balance in the church because not everybody in the building understands speaking in tongues so we're not going to focus on speaking on tongues all week but we're going to hit on it and get them there but we have classes that if you want to focus on that area then go to that class and we'll talk to you about the God you never knew we'll talk to you about the Holy Spirit and if you're into healing we have healing classes but in Sundays we have to prepare a meal that reaches everybody because not all of y'all like liver and onions including this fella right here but if all I did was prepare liver and onions eventually people would be like that church is nothing but liver and onions I'm going to go somewhere where I can get a juicy bacon cheeseburger you know why I didn't do this during the fast right so we have to reach people we have to reach people who we would call seekers and we would say we're not a seeker friendly church but we are a finder friendly church if you want to find God this is the house for you but we're not going to back down 
to make you feel comfortable as a seeker. The goal of the church is to make you uncomfortable until you're a believer. We call that conviction. So if you're bringing a visitor here and you're like, oh, I hope, you might as well just plan that that's going to happen. And prepare them. I hope Pastor Melissa, no, Pastor Melissa is going to do it. She's going to spin like a top and she's going to shout and she's going to dance. You might as well just plan on that. Don't tell people, I hope it doesn't happen. No, that's what they're coming for. Because you're embarrassed by it means that you don't have the right relationship with God either. But we got to produce a balanced meal here. And so we want to reach both seekers and believers. We want to we wanna reach and teach people who are believers and we want to equip believers, but we also have to reach and teach and equip people who are seeking God. And we'll, let's just define a seeker. A seeker is not a church transfer. A seeker is someone who has no biblical pre-knowledge whatsoever. There's somebody who has not yet stepped over the line. They've not grown up in church. They have no idea what church is even at. And sometimes we just have to explain what we do. And it should not offend you that we have to explain some things that go on in the church. There is nothing that goes on in God's house that we should not be able to explain with the word. Let me say that again. If it goes on in the house, we should be able to explain it biblically. Otherwise, what basis do you have to stand on for what you're doing? If you don't know what else to do, go to the word. And so we want to do, we want to feed people and we have an opportunity to feed both believers and seekers every week. And we, we're here to serve one thing, the bread of life. We're not here to serve Pastor Jason or Pastor Melissa because I think a lot of people, they have idolatry in their heart. You will come to church when I'm preaching and you'll worship when your favorite worship leader is worshiping. That's idolatry. I don't care who's behind this pulpit. Y'all don't know this, but Pastor, Pastor Don threw a left hook at y'all today, and I didn't even have to preach. Y'all should just, like, go thank Grizzy. <laughs> like, thanks for, being, thanks for being a dumb dog and running off and, and coming back, because out of that, man, there was a whole lot of prodigals that were getting preached to through Grizzy. <laughs> and, and the other thing is, you cannot confuse style and anointing. You can't confuse it because Don Wilburn and Aaron Porter are two totally different styles, but they do not have different anointings. They have the same anointing. It just is coming out in their own personality. And if you confuse style and personality, you will amen style and miss the anointing. I hope y'all mopping what I'm dropping because I'm trying to be pastor. So, we want to do things and we want to operate. We want to, feed, we want to feed people. But when people come to get the ultimate food, it deserves the ultimate presentation. Now, I'm not talking about coming to the table and you got styrofoam cups, plastic forks, paper napkins, and paper plates, or just having a hot dog weenie roast. No. If I'm going to invite you over to my house and you're going to come to our house, we're not going to use the same things that we use when you're not there. When you show up at our house, Melissa's got all this fancy stuff that she likes to buy, but she never uses it for us. <laughs> Anybody else have this in your house? You have a cabinet over here that's got all these dishes in it, but you never get to use them. Amen. You go to touch them and they'll smack your hand. We ain't washing them again. I'm like, we only use them like once a year. And they're the most expensive thing we've got in the house, but those aren't for you. I'm like, but you're married to me, and we're, I'm supposed to be number one. But if Don and Shelly come over, she's busting out all the stuff. I'm like, when did we buy that? <laughs> I love you. We've been together more than we've been apart, so you're stuck with me. And so what happens to us is, when we, we have people over, we start thinking about creative, powerful, compelling ways to serve some food. To serve, and we have to do the same thing in the churches. People are coming over to God's house. And they're coming to the table. 
Now, we have a choice. Can we just treat them like ho-hum and here's your styrofoam cup and, you know, grab a fork over there and put that over the fire and cook that hot dog and, you know, here's some stuff for some s'mores. Or is it worth going a little bit further and not doing the styrofoam cups and the plastic plates and all that stuff and putting out a spread that's representing who the king of kings is? Because we have to remember that the other person that's showing up at the table besides you and I is Jesus. And we're setting the table. Now, I don't know how many of you like to have people over to your house to eat. I love having people over to our house to eat. And I can probably go through this room and there may be five people who've ever been at my house to eat because I love it. Melissa, not so much. We hired a cleaning lady and we clean the house before the cleaning lady gets to the house. Anybody else there? I'm like, why don't you just pay me? I'm the one cleaning in the first place. She gets here, I've spent six hours, she's in and out for an hour and a half, and you paid her a hundred times more than you've ever paid me. Well, we're trying to keep the cleaning lady's opinion of us at a high level that we're clean people. I'm preaching some truth right now, and whoever is my security officer, the attack's going to come from that direction in just a moment. <laughs> it's going to be a skinny little lady that has love on her sweatshirt, and there won't be any love behind it. <laughs> she loves these sermons. And the night before, she's like, you got to get this done and get this done. And then we get up at 4 o'clock in the morning because the cleaning lady's going to be there at 9 o'clock. And I'm exhausted. And we get home, and I'm so exhausted, I don't even enjoy the clean house. <laughs> Besides that, Zoe comes home first, and the dog's, and it's destroyed before we must not ever get to enjoy it. But here's what happens, right? We don't want to have people over because we have to change our behavior. And then we have these imaginary boundaries of what people really think about us. But listen, everybody in this room is laughing about Melissa and I's lifestyle because you all live the same way. And so we don't invite people over because we want them to think that we live clean. And we all know that the moment that the ring camera goes off and people pull in the driveway, we're making one final sweep through the house to make sure all the underwear and the dirty laundry and the toothpicks and the dental floss and everything is picked up and it all goes into the one closet that it would never go in in any other day of the week, but we throw it in there. And then when people come in, they say, would you like for me to hang up my coat? No, I'll take your coat for you and I'll put it over here on the bed because I don't want you to open that closet door. <laughs> Careful that we don't do that in the church, that we're waiting until the last possible moment to get all the junk that's in our trunk cleaned up and throw it into a closet somewhere. We need to be prepared well ahead of time when people come to God's house. <laughs> human nature is human nature, my friend. But when you, when you come over, like, when, when, you know, it's not you, Melissa, and I love DoorDash. Anybody else love DoorDash? And DoorDash loves Melissa. Because Melissa believes, because we live in Heron, that they deserve a massive love offering called a tip. So, man, the DoorDash drivers clamor to come to our house and just drop food off. And we don't even see them. They just drop the food and we go. But so when it's just us, we're like 9 o'clock at night. We're like, what sounds good? But if we invite you over, we're not thinking about it right at the time we're hungry. We're thinking about it long before we ever even have a conversation with you about coming over. There's something called an invite. You know, if you want to invite people over to dinner, you go to them like, hey, your schedule and my schedule, and can we get this all worked out? And you invite them, and the whole time you're inviting them, you're trying to figure out, like, what do they like to eat? And, and I know they go there, and what are you thinking about this? And, you know, we're starting to think about the atmosphere of the room that night and who's coming over, and all these things are going on. Well, at church, you know, when we invite people, I know you guys are inviting people to church too. And so as soon as I say amen at the end of this sermon, I immediately have to begin to think about the dinner that's happening next week. And I got to start thinking about it and like who's going to be in the room and who's going to be there and what's the atmosphere and do we light candles and what kind of music and all those things that go in to having church. And at the same time, we can't just think about the, the menu, but we also have to think about what it looks like 
when we invite them? Like, what are we inviting them to? Are we inviting them to, uh, you know, just hamburgers and hot dogs? Are we inviting them to steaks? What are we inviting them to? Because the invitation kind of sets the expectation. And so you, you, you ever heard somebody, why don't you come to my church? Well, why should I come to your church? Well, you know, um, I don't know. I go there. <laughs> Compelling. <laughs> And is everybody in your church like you? Uh Uh-huh. Oh, good. So they're all hypocrites and gossips. Great. You're the invite, y'all. You're what has a stamp on it that God has sent to other people to invite them into his presence. So whatever your invite looks like is the expectation they have at the dinner. And so when we invite people, then we have a presentation. And at the presentation, and I'm skipping way through my notes because I feel this heat coming from this side over there. When we get ready to do the presentation, I want you to think about this. Jesus said this in John chapter 4, verse 34. He said, my food, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. John 4, 34. Jesus said, my food, what feeds me is doing the will of God for my life. So I want to say this, Uh, the one reason why there are so many unfulfilled Christians is that you are not being fulfilled because you're not serving. You're not doing the will of God for your life, and so you are very unfulfilled because like Jesus, you said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So in inviting, and then there's work that goes into the presentation of getting ready for people who are coming to the the table and what they're getting ready to do. And so in presentation, there has to be preparation. There is a lot of preparation that goes on. I just sat through so many meetings last week that I'm meeting out. But what were we doing? We were focusing on Good Friday and on Easter. And at the end of the meeting, we begin to talk about you, Shine. Yeah, it's the first week of February and we're talking about December. Why? Because if we're going to present Jesus, then we better be prepared to present him. Have you ever heard somebody say, I'm just going to open my mouth and the Lord's going to fill it? You've never heard that in this church because they never get an opportunity to open their mouth. Because we are to be prepared. We are to come with words prepared. We're to be studying to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. We're not just going to live all week long like we want to and then walk to the pulpit and act like we got it going on. No, we're going to have a relationship with the Lord and be in preparation for his people that are coming to his table. Otherwise, if you don't, then you're treating everybody like they're at the card table. Yeah, I changed my sermons. But I've been prepared to do what God wants me to do. And then God said, I know you're prepared that way, but there's somebody else coming to the table that they're not read interested in eating what I had you prepare earlier. There's a hunger in their life right now, and you need to feed them what I'm telling you to feed them right now. There is a difference there than just saying, every week I'm just going to get up here and I'm going to wing it. We don't wing anything. We are planned, but we are not canned. And we have a schedule here. Absolutely, we have a schedule here. But it goes out the window usually about the first note. (laughs) But we're also not going to belabor the point just because we have a schedule. You saw it today. Melissa said, I feel like Don needs to come right now. And it was the perfect moment. Then why? Because we've been preparing all week long in prayer and in preparation for what God wants to do in this service. Now that we have all these other Sundays that are coming. And whoa, today is Super Bowl Sunday, y'all. But in the church, every Sunday... Every Sunday is Super Bowl Sunday. Every day, every Sunday, we got to have our best game going. Well, we'll just take a Sunday off. No, we will not take a Sunday off because the Sunday you think you're going to take off is the Sunday that God is sending somebody to the table. And if you took the day off, then their place is not prepared. It's going to get tied in here a moment. In other words, when your yes is yes on planning center, then be a yes. It is unfair for people to not know whether you're coming or not. If you RSVP, show up. How many of you have ever had a party and by an hour before the party, everybody starts canceling on you? Are you annoyed? Do you ever invite them back? 
You're preaching better than I am. <laughs> when we prepare, we have to prepare for three things. We actually have to prepare, even though there are six chairs, my preparation with this chair, the head of the table, happens all the time. I'm always preparing to meet God. But in the church, there are three chairs that we have to think about. First is mature believers. Then there are baby believers. Then over here, we have, let's just call them hellbound people. These are the people most of y'all don't like. Mature believers, baby believers, people are going to hell. Now, I'm having to preach to all three of these chairs and keep all three of these people happy. But this person would be most happy if they were preparing to reach these people. And then these people would be happy, right, if these people were helping them be, become what they are. But what most people think about the church is that it should be full of mature believers. I grew up in a church like that. You know what happened? We went from about 350 people to when my dad got voted in, there was 16. Because nobody that was in the mature seat ever wanted to speak to somebody who was not in the same seat as they were. But a healthy church is divided up into thirds. We have a third of the church who is mature. We have a third of the church who is just coming on to know Christ. And we have a third of the church who know nothing about Christ. And all of us would be fulfilled if we have that kind of a healthy ecosystem happening in the church. Because doesn't it get boring, all of us that are mature believers, having to tell the same story to people who've already heard it a hundred times? But it would be invigorating to be able to talk to somebody about Noah's Ark and they don't even know who Noah is. What's an ark? Oh, well, you just helped my studying. I don't even have to study on all these w weird topics that all these believers want to talk about. I can just talk to you about Jesus and who he is and that he died for you and you're excited about that. And we move them from this chair over to this chair. And then they move to this chair and we have to have this very healthy ecosystem. So in this house, there may be people sitting next to you that you're like, I wonder where they were. They were probably at the bar last night. Well, what are they doing in church? What better place for them to be than to be at God's house? I know what conversation is going on right there. You're trying to figure out which one's the hellbounder. It's clay. It's clay. This is two services in a row where I've been speaking that you've been getting picked on. <laughs> All of you on broadcast, that would be beeped out. So we have mature believers, baby believers, brand new Christians, people that are coming to know Christ. So I want to talk to the mature believers, the Christians for a moment. What part are you playing in this process. Are you trying to help these people? Or are you even trying to fill this seat? Or have we gotten so comfortable being around other Christians that we are more comfortable when this seat is empty versus when there is somebody in this seat that doesn't believe like we believe? Listen, our faith can stand the questioning of non-believers. The reason why you don't like them to question it is because you don't have the answers because you have grown to maturity by age and not by knowledge. See, I grew up when people would ask me a question, I'd say, well, the pastor said so. Not what the Bible had to say about it, but the pastor said. Now when people ask me, I want to say, this is where it's at in the scripture that talks about that. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Why does it say that? And begin to, because the Bible, again, Paul said, study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. Prepare yourself. So what role are the mature believers playing in filling this seat and not just filling this seat, but moving these people from this seat over to this seat and ultimately to this seat? In other words, are we replacing ourselves? One thing, one, one thing that has to leave the church is the intimidation of the non-believer. It has to leave. And the one reason why we're intimidated by other people is we think they're out to get our position. They are. But you're going to move to another position. My role is changing in this church. I'm now more the coach than I am the player. I'm getting older. 
It's hard to believe. I've been here almost 15 years. I got here when I was 32 years old. I was the player. I wanted to do everything. I had my hands in everything. Now, if you ask me what was going on in this church, you know what I'm going to say? Go ask Donna. I have to ask Donna, where am I supposed to be? Who am I talking to? What am I doing? How long am I going to be there? What am I eating today? What day is it? What time is it? Why? Because my role is changing. And all of our roles are changing. So now I'm having to look at these three chairs and I'm having to look at it and the board's going to love this moment because they've been after me for years about it. Who's going to fill this chair and ultimately move to this chair and then ultimately move to my chair? Because we can't have a one generational church we can't have a church where the next pastor in doesn't believe in the Holy Spirit because he wasn't in our culture and didn't understand how we had church. Because somebody's got to pastor your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and give them the same experience at the table that you got at the table. And that's only going to happen if we that are in this seat right here care about this seat right here. Some of you are all scared. Is he resigning? it? Nope. You got me for a long time. You got me till the Cubs win the World Series forever and my phone's about to ding here in just a moment so I, I want to try to hurry to a close but I want to how many of you back before the pandemic would ever go to a food court in a restaurant or a, in a mall anybody ever been to a food court in a mall so have you ever walked by the Chinese restaurant and there's a woman out there with a plate of food with toothpicks in it. And she has one thing to say. Sample? Sample? No, I don't want to sample. Sample? And then reaches it and grabs it and hands it to you. And you had no thought of even eating at that place until you tasted their orange chicken. And you're like, you know what? I got a hankering for some orange chicken. You were headed over there. And all of a sudden, because they're out there giving samples away, of their food to cause you to have a hunger to go and sit at their restaurant. But most of us in the church want people to come and taste the restaurant and taste God without ever having a sample of them. You're the sample. And all of us are out on the highways and the byways and you don't know it or not, but the word that's being spoke over the top of you, every time you walk in the room is sample, 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 because they're tasting you and whether, whether the taste that they get in their mouth about you is whether or not they'll show up at God's restaurant. So make sure that when they taste and see that it's good. It's good. And because what normally happens is as Christians, we have forfeited the opportunity to give samples. We have forfeited because most of us are so mean and nasty. It's a pickle. Take it off the cheeseburger instead of losing your mind on a 15-year-old kid who's actually working. Take off your purpose shirt. Have another shirt underneath it, but take your purpose shirt off if you're going to act that way. Because you, listen, you're not only representing me in this house, you're representing Christ. I was at Rural King the other day, and the poor, the poor cashier, I felt so bad for her. She had to apologize to me like 30 times. The, this, cash, the, this cash register froze, the next one froze, the next one, the batteries were dead in the scanner. Then she scanned the whole order in, and nothing came up on the screens. And she said, you're being so patient. And I go, you know, there's a lot of things to get worked up over. This isn't one of them. And she said, started talking to me, and then she goes, I think I know you. <laughs> and I'm like, and now you know why I didn't get worked up, because then it would have been, aren't you the pastor at Purpose House, and you're upset because I didn't have the batteries in my little scanner there? Instead, I was able to talk to her and walk her through some transitions that were getting ready to happen in her life. You cannot forfeit the opportunity to be a sample for Jesus Christ. So we have to think about that. We have to think about what, how we taste, how we act, how we speak. We're representing Jesus Christ. And also I think the church should look at some things and say, what are the barriers that are keeping people from God's house? And what are the barriers that are keeping God's house from being a leader in innovation and in technology and in finances? 
I, I just come against the thought that we are the church behind the tracks. I believe that God's church is the head and not the tail. I don't believe as a city goes, so goes the church. I believe as the church goes, so goes the city. We're the head. We're the leader. That's why there's such a move to silence the Christian voice in politics and in business because there's an anointing and there is a favor on God's people that we are actually supposed to lead and not follow. I believe we should be the wealthy people. Why? Because the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. So, if the, God's wealth is laid up for us, then we should be wealthy. We should have business minds. I believe that God's people are the blessed people and they are the favored people. I know it's hard for some of you to believe that, but if you believe that, if you're the head and not the tail, you're above only or never beneath, that's why we have that mantra and we're teaching your kids that every day. Because we're supposed to lead and not follow. So the church should say, what are the barriers that are keeping people? Like, what's wrong with the church having the best show in town? I'm going to look at the cameras just for a moment. What's wrong with us having the best musicians? What's wrong with us playing skillfully before the Lord? What's wrong with us having the best singers? Most of the singers that win Grammys and Nami's started in church, but the church lost them. And it's time for us to reclaim and to redeem what the enemy has been stealing from us. The church should have the best. We should have the best buildings, the best technology. We should be the leaders of innovation. We should be the leaders of every bit of it. Your child should be able to serve in this church and go get a job in Nashville. Why? Because we've already trained them to do it. Best sound men, best lights, best everything. Why? Because God created it all. And when the enemy uses it, people pay big money for it. But the church uses it and people criticize it. We have it backwards. They're using what God gave us. We need to use what God gave us. So you, can, you can watch God. God's very innovative. He used fruit with Adam and Eve, gave an illustration. He used salt to give an illustration with Lot and his wife. He used a boat and a whale to teach us a lesson through Jonah. And ultimately, he used the cross to teach the whole world a lesson about sacrifice and redemption. So what's wrong with the church using it? We should redeem it. And we need to lead the church, lead it in creativity and uniqueness, and leverage everything that we have to our advantage. I don't want to get off of Facebook. Why? Because the enemy is using it for something. The church should use it for something. We should be involved in it in every area and lead in it. So the other thing we have to do is feed his sheep. This is what Jesus told Peter in John chapter 21, verse 18. We need to feed the sheep. And as preachers, all of our leaders in here, we're the chefs. We're Guy Fieri's. Sometimes we got to go to the diner, sometimes we got to go to the dive, and sometimes we got to go to the drive in. But we got to reach them. We got to feed the sheep. And so, my job as the pastor is to not muddy up the food. I need to talk in language that people understand. Melissa tells me all the time I have a great knack for making the complex more complex. We have to take something that is complex and try to break it down in simple ways for people to understand, right? You're going to have people come in here when we take communion. You're like, are you really drinking blood? No, this is a type. But it's okay. We have to make the complex very simple. How does that happen in our lives? So we need to be simple but not simplistic. And keep breaking the bread of life out for people. And reaching all three of these chairs. I'm moving quick. So we've got preparation. We've got invitation. Then we have the presentation. We want to show people. And give them answers on how to take the food, to receive the food, and to take that food and make that food a part of their body. I remember the first time that I ever went to a fancy restaurant. We went to the Chardonnay in Naples, Florida. And my dad's taking all of us little kids into the Chardonnay. And when we walked in there, he was trying to walk us through the, the restaurant. But the maitre d' stepped in and began to teach us how to take our napkin and what the napkin meant, where we placed it on the table was a signal to him to do something for us and what each fork was. And he was breaking this down and it caused all of us to be at ease because we had no idea what we were doing. But because somebody else that had experience was teaching us how to receive the food, how to eat the food and how to be proper when we did it, it was taking pressure off of us. 
And what we need to do in the church is we need to explain some things to some people about how to eat the food and how to receive the food and how to consume the food. And this is how you worship and this is how you praise and this is why we give offerings and this is why we give of our tithe and this is why we do these things. It's not that we're trying to be simplistic, but we're trying to make it simple because you live in a world where they don't understand anything that goes on here. Why would I lift my hands? Why would I bow my knee? Why did that person lay on the floor? Why is she dancing like that? We can back it up with the word and teach them how and why we do the things that we do. Present it in a way that is understandable to people. And we want to show people and we want to give them answers for their questions. And when we give them answers, we have to think about all three of the chairs that are represented. Sometimes I'm going to have to say something that only these people might get. Or these people get. or these, And I might say something all of them get. But the job is to prepare the food for all sects of life. And make sure that everybody knows what we're talking about here. You know, when Melissa and I came here to southern Illinois, it was quite interesting. We had heard about all these churches, and there was a church on every corner in southern Illinois. At that time, it was home to one of the larger television ministries in the country. And people are like, this is going to be a tough go of it for you guys. You're going to try to establish a Pentecostal church in southern Illinois. And we thought, this is just, you know, everybody I met was Christians. Well, I gave you statistics before that proves to you that not everybody is a Christian. And if you think everybody in southern Illinois is a Christian, they're not. But the enemy would have you to believe that everybody is a Christian so that you no longer have to present the gospel to people because you think they've already heard it. When in fact, the vast majority of people have never heard it. At least they've never heard it in a way that is enticing enough for them to want to go beyond hearing into receiving it. And the church has got to do something amazing to get people to become a family of God. And there's a lot of people in church who need to get back involved in being a part of the church. And what the number one thing I've noticed about Southern Illinois, and if I'm offensive to you, I'm sort of meaning to be. There is a lot of people who are very diet driven. And they think that health only comes through being diet driven. I'm going to eat my way to losing weight. Or I'm going to, no, if you ever go to a doctor and the doctor wants you to get healthy, he's going to tell you there's two things you need to do. You must have heard this. <laughs> Diet and exercise. And in the church, we believe that being a part of the church is to be a here only. Diet. And we never exercise. There are some really spiritually obese people in the church who do nothing but consume and never exercise and serve in their gift. We have heard enough gospel to be saved. See, we've developed something, and you're going to learn something about me in this, and this was not in my notes, so Pastor Melissa, you may want to come and tackle me. But God has a real sense of humor to make me a pastor. Because I despise the way that the church is. We have made the church into what we've wanted it to become. And not what God has wanted it to become. We've turned the church into a system of policies and procedures. And church services that are acclimated to what we like. And not what God desires. We want church services to start when we want them to start. Go how we want them to go. And end when we want them to end. And God has no pleasure in any of that. God wants to move when he wants to move, and he wants to move all the time. And he's not interested in your cutoff time. He's interested in reaching your soul and your family's souls. And what we have done is we've devised church to be three songs, a little sermon, and get out the door. My friend, that's not working. If that worked, then the statistics that I read to you at the beginning would be the complete opposite. So you have got to get out of your mind that church is going to be this little thing in a box. This table is going to expand. This table is going to have different meals at it. Why? Because it keeps people wanting to come back for more. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in a dead, dry, boring church. If I want a hamburger that will never go away, I'll go to McDonald's. I know what they serve. 
And based on my appetite, I can choose the restaurant that I want. The problem is there's only one table in the gospel. And it has to satisfy every person's needs. And every person needs to come to this table. You know why I know that? Jesus said there's only one way. There's only one way. You have to come to this table to get saved. So when the Bible talks about things, the Bible definitely is, is diet all the way through it. But we cannot be hearers only. We also have to be doers. You can read, go read James chapter 1. So we have to have diet and we have to have exercise. And teach other people how to have diet and how to, to have exercise. But what happens is, is you, if you're not careful, you'll get a, a, there'll be a spirit in the church that goes from, how can I serve to feed me? Feed me, Pastor. Make sure your sermon's aimed at me. Do you realize how many people right now have never heard the message of Jesus Christ? And while we're claiming and clamoring to be fed, we already have so much food in us that we are sluggish and they're starving to death while we're saying, feed me. Feed me. Come on, pastor, one more sermon, feed me. Can we have church on these nights and these nights and these nights? How about we reach lost people? If you've been around here long enough, especially those of you on staff, I have a mantra around here. This church does not grow on Sundays. This church grows on Mondays. Because anybody can show up at 10 o'clock on Sunday. But how many people are willing to dive in deeper on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays and go beyond? What are they doing? They're moving from this seat to this seat to this seat. Be careful that we don't get a feed me mentality in God's house. In other words, what we have to do is have such a diet around here that people are excited to come back to God's house. I want people to walk in here and say, what's coming next? They're going to have a roller coaster again in, in December. They're going to have a Ferris wheel. What are they going to have? Why? We've got to do something that catches their attention, that causes them to want to hear the message of Jesus Christ. What's coming next? Who's speaking next? What kind of video are they going to do? What kind of song are they going to sing? What, what's going to happen? You have to be consistently consistent and inconsistent at the same time. Being simple but not simplistic and serving a balanced diet of diet and exercise and a balanced diet of the bread and life. You say, well, why, why should the church be concerned with any of that? There's an old song, and this is going to show my age a little bit, but there's an old song called Breakfast in Hell. Maybe you've heard it. These are the words. It says, when the toast is burned and the milk is turned and Cap'n Crunch is waving farewell, and when the big one finds you, May this song remind you that they don't serve breakfast in hell. So the church has got to realize that this is not just a meal to be a meal. They don't serve breakfast in hell. The only place and only destination that's going to have a meal served at it is the marriage supper of a lamb. And we have got to get so concerned about this seat and why it's empty we can decry our nation and talk about politics and go vote. How about you go witness? Because they don't serve breakfast in hell. They don't serve heroin in hell either. They don't serve alcohol in hell. And everything that's sending people to hell won't be there when they get there, but they'll be there. But here's the amazing thing. What we're serving, when they get there, it will be there. All the things that are sending them to hell that they're consuming and they're eating right now, when they get there, they won't be able to consume and eat it when they get there to hell. But if you'll serve them the bread of life, when they get to heaven, that'll be there. Jesus will be there. And so they're coming into an introduction to him now, but they'll know him forever. And so you've got to convince people that everything that's sending you to hell that you're doing right now, if you can walk away from that, Come over here and eat the bread of life. What's going to happen at your church? I don't know. Pastor Melissa is probably going to come out, spin like a top, and sing five songs you've never heard before. And you're going to have tears, and your makeup's going to be rolling, and pretty soon you're going to be in the floor, and you're going to be, what in the world are they doing? But, but I'm doing it too. Welcome to church. Welcome to the table of the Lord. People say, oh, is there room for me? Absolutely, there's room for you. 
Just hang on a second. Some of the people who serve so amazingly around here, they're going to grab another leaf at the table. They're going to grab a couple other place settings. Oh, and if we don't have a chair, here, why don't you take mine? And you sit here. And I'll serve you while you eat because I've already ate. Because they don't serve breakfast in hell. So with every head bowed and with every eye closed. Lord, you talked about the harvest and that the harvest was plenty, but the labors were few. And you said, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send labors. So, Lord, I'm praying right now that you would send us as laborers. That we would serve the bread of life so compelling, so amazing, so powerfully, so innovatively, Lord, that people will come from the highways and the byways. And when they get here, Lord, we're going to serve them. Every person who has a gift is going to use the gift that you gave to them. And they're going to use it to serve one another well. And we're going to serve well, Lord, because we have a clear understanding that there is no breakfast in hell. And we have to reach them right now before it's too late. And so, Lord, may we never get over the people who are dying without you. May we never lose the burden of being a reaper. But, Lord, would you set a burden in each of us that it would be our food. It would be what drives us and motivates us and energizes us to do the will of the Father who sent us to help complete this work to reach the lost for you. And I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ and all of God's people said, amen. So over the next three weeks, I'm going to ask you to sign up somewhere to serve. Serve somewhere. Serve in being an usher, a greeter, parking lot team. Our broadcast team is expanding and growing in all kinds of ways. It's, it's the front door of our church. Most people who come through membership, they say, I came because I watched a video. Welcome to church. Serve in the champion's room. I think champion's room is going to turn from champion's room into the healing room. And children with autism are going to walk in with autism but walk out healed. Serve in the champion's room. Serve. Serve on the prayer team. Serve on the baptismal team. Serve on the stage team. You want to talk to me every Sunday? Carry my pulpit out. I'll talk to you. I'll tell you a joke on the way back. Serve, serve on the worship arts team. There's so many places to serve holding a baby because it's really hard for God to speak to people when their baby's screaming in their ear and God's trying to whisper to them. Hold their baby. Love the baby. Teach kids. You want to change a generation? Change a child. Changes a generation. There's so many places to serve. God gave you a gift. Use it. And make it your food to do the will of God for your life. So if you would, across the building, would you stand with me? We've already had our altar call. What a beautiful moment. Thank you, Don. Thank you for being the man of God that you are and serving in your gift. You do it well. Thank you, Pastor Melissa and the team. You, you guys serve us every week. Thank you. To every person who serves in this house, you're amazing. You're serving the bread of life. You're serving at the table of the Lord and you're preparing it. Thank you. So we love you. There are all kinds of events that are happening right after the service. If you want to know what they are, ask Donna. <laughs> you can go to the Church Center app. And while we're talking about that, Pastor Willis and I will never send you a message asking for money. That's a scam. Block them, delete them, and don't leave your checkbooks on the floor. We love you. I love this house, and I love the people of this house. But more than anything, I love the Lord. May you have a blessed week. 
and go in God's peace and his grace. And I'll see you next Sunday right here at 10 o'clock in Jesus' name. Thank you again for tuning into the Purpose House Church YouTube channel. When you're on site here, we do a three-week challenge asking you to come to any and all of our services for three weeks. And we believe that you would find your new church home. But now that you're online, I'm asking you to do the three-click challenge. Click the subscribe button, click the like button, and click the share button. By liking and sharing our video, you're helping us fulfill our purpose of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. Then if you would, in the comment section, please let me know where you're watching from and if there is anything that we can pray with you about in your life. Thank you again for tuning in to the Purpose House Church YouTube channel, and I look forward to seeing you again real soon.